To the truth in this art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and I am thrilled to welcome my next guest. They're a photographer from Baltimore who works as the director of photographic services for the marketing and communications department at Towson University. She has been with Towson for the last seven years and has shaped the photographic identity of the university with award winning work. Please welcome Lauren Castellana. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. I love this green background, by the way. I think that's green. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so um, for, for, for those like listening, they're not going to be able to see this green. So we'll, we'll figure it out post. It's fine. Um, <laughs> can you also see my Parasite poster back there? <laughs> I can. I was going to comment on that. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to have some movie questions. You're giving yourself more questions to answer. That's um, all right. <laughs> so as we, we, we dive into it... Um, I would like to learn about the guests, like, you know, sort of the origins of, you know, those early seeds, you know, of creativity, where they were planted, where are they, they from? So for, for you, you know, if you would describe sort of your background, the education components that go along with it. And if you will, sort of your first experience with photography, whether it be appreciating photography, whether it, you know, I took pictures of my iPhone back in the day. Talk about that, if you will. Uh, my first experiences with photography started in high school. Um, I knew that I loved art. I loved painting and drawing in high school. And I knew that someday that I would do something with art. But then I took a photo class. And this was a analog dark room class in high school. And um, I fell in love with it. As soon as I like took my first roll of film. I was shocked that it turned out at all because I didn't know like all the numbers and it was so confusing, but I somehow figured it out and I developed my first roll and printed it and was like, wow, this is, this is it. I'm, I'm going to try to make a career out of this and keep it up. After that, I, I went on to my, um, to, to college. I went to Towson university, uh, studied photography. Yeah. I kept it going. Um, had some good experiences there, did freelance for a few years after graduation. Uh, then I got a job at Towson and I've been there for the last seven years. That's that's great. I, I like when that opportunity to kind of, you know, stay in the, you know, the, the, the golden black, or for me, I went to Morgan. So the, uh, the, the blue and orange and being able to kind of stay in that, that zone, it's like, I don't have to go far, you know? <laughs> and, and, and kind of being aware of it and kind of like putting your stamp on it as a professional, I would imagine that that just, you know, was a was maybe a motivation as well. No. Well, I, I don't think I even knew that there was a photographer on campus when I was an undergrad. Um, I didn't do any internships there. I didn't know there was like a marketing and communications department. I didn't know my boss. Um, even apparently everyone else did. Kanji, everybody knows him. Um, but I had no idea until I was in the freelance realm and the job posting came up and I was like, wow, this is perfect. I was already doing some freelance for like the University of Maryland. And I was like, this is a great avenue for me to go towards. And uh, it was great to come back. So, you know, I must ask, like, as far as you know, some of the, cause I'm, as I'm looking back over your website now and I, I, there it's very interesting, very interesting. I, I have even more <laughs> questions again, you know, it should like, it should be keep Rob away from other visuals because he's just going to have more questions and I'm just going to go off the top of the dome, but which photographers, as you kind of think back, you know, were ones that you're like, I like the way that they shoot. I like their lighting. I like their, their choices or what have you. What are some of those like early influences? Um, cause I find like, when we're trying to get our footing and we're trying to figure mm -hmm. out like where we're going with what we're doing, we're not copying, but we are <laughs> borrowing. I'm stealing, but we are borrowing from like people that we admire and we can kind of see what they're doing. So talk about some of your like early influences in terms of photography or art visually, more macroly speaking. Sure. Um, I, I went to a lot of museums and I tried to see as much photography as I could. Um, of course, I'm like blanking on everybody's names right now. But um, let's see, well, I can tell you, at least who I 
look at now uh because i can remember their names but um so i i look a lot to uh gregory crutzen and his work he's a contemporary photographer um alex prager also contemporary um i also take a lot of inspiration from painters and other artists like edward hopper um i can see a lot of similarities in our like compositions um and you know how we place figures and scenes it's, it's interesting to hear like some of the the other interests that kind of pop in um with someone's work like I always use this this uh, analogy or this sort of comparison where i had a conversation with a chef and he was like yeah you know it's a guitar that i a guitarist that i really like and i get inspiration for him and somehow it how i approach my work in the kitchen i was like how do those things connect are you like playing the guitar with like a fish or something like what are you what are you doing but hearing about you know sort of broader like interests i think when we stay like silo like when folks ask me you know what podcast do you listen to i was like i don't really listen to podcasts and, you know i i will listen to, i'll listen to other types of interviewers who will have you and i'll get something from that or it's a lot of audio books to kind of get inspiration on how to maybe craft a question or craft a conversation yeah, I I would say most of my inspiration comes from movies and cinema. And uh, my favorite part of movies is watching the behind the scenes and the interviews with the directors and actors. And like, I want to see how it was made. I want to see the like the miniatures that they use and I, I want to see how they lit it and like everything that goes into it, because that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. You know, you see, yeah, you can give me questions. Uh, <laughs> So how would you like describe your work for someone like I, I've seen different things I've seen sort of you're you're doing a litany of work in public relations, you've done um, photography for for athletics and things of that nature. But what are like maybe three words that come to mind when, you know, your work is described or how you present your work? And I have a second part to that question, but I at least want to start there. Three words. OK. Sure. Um I mean, the first one seems simple, but creative. Um, I like to kind of push the boundaries of what I'm photographing, whether that's like just style or color or atmosphere or anything like that. Um, and lighting, lighting is what I'm always thinking about. Um, you know, it makes it makes the image um, manipulating lighting working with it. I use a lot of um, strobes and artificial lighting for my work. Um, last word, one more word. Um, already said it, but color. I love color. I think you could probably see that from my portfolio. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so so yes, I'm talking broadly about my work, yeah. but um, I do have a like work portfolio and I have my like MFA creative portfolio. So there you can see they're pretty they're pretty different. Uh <laughs> the word surreal pops up a few times as I'm uh, diving into the uh, research. I, I love I love surreal. I love anyone that says that my work reminds them of surrealism. <laughs> but uh obviously my public relations marketing work um not not so much, but I I think that they go hand in, in hand. I like, I love my job and I love photographing new people every day and um, create, you know, creating that, that look for all of my portraits and then in turn for the whole university. But so everything I learn day to day photographing, um, it all helps me to create the work that I want to make for, for myself. You know all of that knowledge and um, equipment and inspiration and just doing it every single day and getting better and better yeah de definitely color pops as i'm going through and I'm still kind of going through this portfolio i was like this sets a tone i'm, I'm getting sort of and, and i want to be i want to be able to reference the exact thing i'm looking at it's, it's one within the fine art portfolio piece. And I'm like, okay, that's neon. That's really cool. I like this. This gives me a vibe. Something has happened. <laughs> is, it, is it like this bathroom <laughs> with sort of this neon tinge and the layering of the paint and sort of the blue? It's like, I like this. I want to know more what's happening in the story here. And <laughs> I think 
creating a a sort of visual language through the photography, through through the choice of lighting, through the choice of colors that are there. I think that that's something that I'm seeing very evident in your work um, from from this sort of the portfolio. You're like you're like personal, you're, you're freelance, your projects. And then I think you're taking those same sensibilities with your work within Towson. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. Um, yeah, I, I try to you know, I try to make my work symbiotic as I possibly can. Um, and I try to, to create that feeling um, and that like intimacy that I can create with my my own work and still have that for, for my marketing work. I still I still want the same things. You know, maybe just not as uh, neon or not not as uh, weird or kind of off putting. I think I like to, you know, my work every day is like making people look as good as they possibly can and making them them happy and then making everything nice and big and bright. And then, you know, when I get home and I want to make work, I kind of just want to make the opposite of it. So it like it still work. It it works together. And you know, I want to make you know, weird stuff that I, that I can't make at work. I dig that. And I, I think like I've, I've done the sort of freelance or podcaster for hire sort of thing. And there are very, um, you know, where the boundaries are of what you're doing here. And it's like, we want to bring you in here to host this. We want maybe 15% of your personality. Don't start asking people about their ice cream choices and things of that nature. No rapid fire questions, or Ooh. these are the approved rapid fire questions. So I definitely feel you on that. So, so talk about lighting a little bit more like the the, the the approach you have for for lighting within your work um maybe how it differs for you know some of your your like your work the work that you're like all right now it's time to put on the the dark lights and then we switch it up a little bit you know you may change your glasses to uh the work that you're doing like for for marketing within within taos and like do you approach lighting differently how do you approach it like 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 really differently um for my for my personal work I I kind of I, I definitely approach it different because I'm lighting scenes instead of just people so it's it's quite different when you know if I'm lighting an, an interior scene um, and I need the interior to be to lit the way I want it to be lit and then the person um, it's that's it's pretty hard compared to just a portrait because you can go into a portrait um you know lighting it the same way you have your you know your key light you might have a hair light side light um once you do it enough it can be pretty prescribed mm -hmm. but when i go into it for my fine artwork i'm more like you know i can have you know four plus lights and i like it's more about like building something um and trying to create something different um with with the lighting and the different like modifiers and um for most of my stuff i ended up compositing things because they're not i want the person to be lit differently than the room or if i can't mm -hmm. get them to match up or if i don't want them to match up and i want it to feel a little odd and um surreal then I, I also do like composites for, for lighting. That, this, that is, that's so interesting. <laughs> it's like, well, I want this to look, like, I want this to have this lighting, but then I want the person to have something different and eh, we'll see where we go. Yeah. I try not to be too, you know, hardcore, the technical language, but I just wanted to, to come across. No, I appreciate that. And <laughs> there, there may be a technical question that comes up later, um, but technical <laughs> and maybe how we, we, we look at things. So, switching switching gears to touch um so you know as a photographer with uh with ties to baltimore you know we you you, you probably understand why i started this podcast in terms of like now nah, we need to change this narrative a little bit um mm -hmm. what do you believe the in in the macro sense what do you believe the role of a photographer is or photography in general is in terms of like documenting what's in baltimore what have you showing baltimore showing the beauty of the city and showing the differences of the city the uniqueness what is the role of photography or photographers in kind of pre presenting those perceptions and that understanding of the city uh that's a great question um you know 
thinking of like photo theory and a role as a photographer, um, you know, your first thought would be to to document what's around you. And that's that's not exactly what I do, but I think that it's extremely important um, for Baltimore photographers to, you know, photograph um, our city and show it the way that we want to show it. Um, I have done some um, like documentary photography and it's really, it's really um, more difficult than, than I think people think, you know, you're, you, you take on a lot of responsibility when you, when you photograph something um, and how you want it to be perceived. And we have some really, really wonderful, talented people here. And yeah. it's always really exciting when they're getting, um, you know, the exposure that they deserve. Like, and I'm thinking of Devin Allen and all everything that he's done for Baltimore. And he's just, you know, he's out there and he's killing it. It's doing great. I mean, I, I whenever I have any uh, photography or any opportunities, because it's something that I'm going to add more into this to kind of document these sort of in-person interviews and things of the sort. I'm like, make sure you have the thinning filter. Uh, make sure you have the hair filter so I can like have hair. I was like, whatever it's needed to make me look my best. That's the purpose, right? Make, make me look my best. Everyone else, no. They don't, I don't care about them. I care about myself. I need to look <laughs> So how, for, for, for you, like, you know, what is your sort of, sort of like, photography or you're shooting like cadence and I, and ultimately what I'm getting at is how do you know when a when a photograph just does, when an image just doesn't work and you know mm -hmm. like what are sort of those those traits there because I've you know as I said I'm bringing in more people who who work within that realm and I remember I did a photo shoot and the person took like 75 pictures and I was like cool yeah. and he's like yeah man pick through pick through these the ones that you like and I've done other ones where it's like just five pictures and they were all fire. So like, how do you, you know, what, what is your sort of rubric and like, how do you go about your work? Hmm. Oh, cadence of shooting. So I think usually when you, when you take, when you take a good photo, you, you know, like, you, you know, you're looking at like composition, lighting, you're like, you know, posing of the person. If they, if they feel good, they look good. And like, you you know um i tend i tend to overshoot i think for most things i'm an overshooter um i would probably take like you know i'd be the person that takes 75 pictures of you for like one portrait that can be used because i know that you know you need to have backups and you know different locations and try different things because especially if the first thing you try isn't working it's like okay let's try something else let's yeah. just like switch it up um so I tend, I definitely tend to to shoot more than I need to. That way, I have a lot of different options. Because then, you know, you don't want to have to reschedule and come back and do it again. Like, spend the time and and do it right when you're there. It's almost like a uh, a carpenter's approach when it's like, yeah, just you got to measure a lot. You got to measure a yeah. lot. You got to have backups. Measure twice, <laughs> cut once, right? One hundred percent. Um. So, the relationship between so stepping back a little bit you know describe like the the gear that you you generally use or what have you like whether it's you know because i would imagine you know sort of towson well to strike that what is what is the gear that you you're generally using and i have like a question around technology you know related to that but what's the gear that you're generally using to do your 75 uh <laughs> shots <laughs> Uh, so I just recently switched over to mirrorless, um, switching both from Nikon. Oh, I've used Canon as well um, to Sony right now. So I'm using the the Sony A1, and then I use a you know mix of of lenses from Sony and Sigma, and then most of all of my lighting now is Profoto because it's the best. <laughs> so, and, and thank you for that. Um, so sort of that relationship between technology and photography, like the, the the practice around it, the actual application, how do you manage like sort of the the balance between we're doing everything digital and, you know, some of the sort of practical in person components kind of we're, we're trying to find ways to take more and more out of it. Like right now, 
you know, this medium we're doing, you know, remotely. But, you know, maybe if this was like, quote unquote, a radio show for sake of argument, we probably would be in the same studio. So I'm making an effort to kind of change that because, you know, people get Zoom fatigue or technology fatigue. So mm-hmm. how do you balance sort of, you know, a a, a digital process uh, that, that at times can be a digital process or the amount of digital within this 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 project or the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's a very technology heavy art, uh, very expensive um, art to make, um, you know, with prices of cameras and you need, you know, your computers and hard drives and archives and everything else. It can be, it can be a lot to keep up with. And I don't necessarily think that I am a technology savvy person. Uh, I just love camera gear and um, I love learning about it and, that's why I switched to mirrorless because the like the the capabilities of just like of focusing and the electronic viewfinder are like game changing, um, especially with um, with like you know, portraits and making sure everything is in focus or shooting athletics and everybody is running around and, and it's like you know it it was kind of an art to be able to focus on the on like just saying like a basketball game or something, being able to focus on them. And now we have um, the technology that it can like track people and it can track their eyes and make sure it's always in focus. And as it's, you know, it's a new technology, but it's also like it, it's making our lives easier in the end. And the, like the less I have to think about all of those settings and trying to get focus on the person's eye instead of their nose yeah. uh, i can like i can connect with the with the person more and, and talk to them because it's less i have to stress about later mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i you know as you were describing like this sort of tracking for athletics i immediately thought of the new commercial for like the iphone where that mom is just running down the sideline while our kid is running and not losing focus that's like, mm-hmm. I haven't like, seen that. You should check it out. She's like yeah. tackling people and it's like <laughs> not losing focus, a steady cam on him. And it's like, that's, that's really interesting. And I think, I think having, cause you're, you're right. Like, you know, sort of video and some of the, some of this digital sort of creative work, it isn't the easiest thing to get in because of the cost. And it takes mm-hmm. a certain degree of knowledge, talent, and like practice in like maybe things that are, you know, different types of materials. Like I'm using this, this recording board, right? This mixer right now, that's eight years old. And I'm like, I just needs an upgrade and uh, some nice stuff out there now, but do I feel like dropping that money and it's mm-hmm. still kind of serving a purpose, but eventually I'm going to have to transition to something else. And if I were to go there and maybe teach a class, because that's that's another thing you're you're also doing instruction and things of that nature. But, mm-hmm. you know, if I would go and teach a class like, hey, firstly, you want to have a couple thousand dollars to invest in your studio. They're going to look at me like I'm crazy. Right. So I got I got two more like real, real questions for you. Um, talk about the, the education components. I think that's a natural segue there. Talk about like, you know, what some of those findings will talk about what that experience is like. Yeah, share share a bit about that with us. Um, so I I work with uh, student employees and interns for my job, and um, we we bring them on to give us extra help because we're we only have two photographers. Um, we bring them in for us and for them to learn. There's there's a lot that we have to do that they they don't teach in mm-hmm. school. They're not teaching a lot of like practical skills, uh, like for events and um, event lighting and um, just general general things that like a freelancer would have to do. So mm-hmm. we on and we we teach them um, and get them to do more work for us. We they also do like um, digital asset management for us and like so they can get like well-rounded skills for trying to get jobs when they, when they graduate. Um, And then I realized, you know, after working with students for so long that I like teaching. And then during when I'm getting, when I was getting my, um, my master's degree, I took a, a class that was like a college level teaching class and I TA'd in a lighting class. 
the same, technically the same lighting class I took as an undergrad, just, it, you know, different professors have, have gone by, but um, it's like, wow, I, I love this and I want to start teaching this. So um, next fall, I'm going to start teaching that, that photo lighting class at Towson and have that basically every semester and then, and do some um, like lectures here and there. That's great. I, I think having sort of like this is these are the things they don't tell you in class sort of that <laughs> it can be really can be really cool because um i i like the opportunity to kind of teach people sort of the dark arts of podcasting which made it sound really weird there but <laughs> i i like being able to help folks with you know like i approach what i do almost in a macgyver sort of way and you pick up certain little, little tricks and, and things along those lines by just kind of doing it and you know, at times I'll forget, you know, pieces of my gear. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to get audio? How am I going to get sound? Uh, can I use this as a headphone? It's me, but, it, you know, a string and two Dixie cups, but we make it happen. It, it, it works right. somehow. And right. those, those would be the things that often, you know, I think when it comes to sort of some of the ways that things are, are taught, it's almost like perfect environment. But it's like, here's the troubleshooting. Here's the real version of it. And I think that's very, uh, very useful, very important. Right. Um, kind of going back to like equipment, you know, you really, especially when you're first starting out, like you don't, you don't need the most expensive camera that there is. You don't need the most expensive equipment. You can take great photos without having that. It can be harder to do, but it, you know, it is possible. You can do, you can do a lot with just the knowledge of, of everything. Like I have my, my light for this, um, zoom call is kind of like macgyvered it's like a light and i've gaff taped a piece of paper over it so it's a little diffused to like i, I know this isn't going to be shown but you know that that is a, piece, is a piece of paper that's diffusing my light and trying to make it look just a little bit better yeah. so those kind of things are super knowledgeable to know for for students like you don't need to buy a 200 dollars softbox if you could use a paper or a paper plate or something you know it's it's about being resourceful yeah. um and hopefully that money will come eventually yeah it's just just kind of like I, one of the things i used to say we'll go to the last question in a second one of the things i used to say when people say man you get so much done man the quality is great and so on it's like you should see me with a budget that's literally <laughs> what i what i say to people you know um, because I'm I'm using a ring light right now and like some okay. webcam to try to make this work, and I am dimming this right. ring light so much because it, it bugs me at times. It was just like start getting. It's brighter. pretty bright, yeah. <laughs> so so finally, you know, I I want to kind of like open this up for you know this is almost the pre shameless plug portion of the podcast, but okay. I want to want to frame it in this way. What are what are some projects um, that you've worked on, you've organized, or that you you know have on a, the uh, horizon that you're really excited about, really really proud of, things of that sort. Speak on that a bit. Um, after five and a half years of taking graduate classes, I'm finally graduating with uh, my master's of fine arts. Uh, I don't know when this will air, but if it's before February 9th, the opening is at 7.30 um, at the Center for Arts at Towson. We have uh, me and two other amazing artists that are that are graduating in that show as well. So that's what I'm currently working on, trying to get all of the framing and the printing and the mounting and installing for the gallery. Uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, you know, most of my world is, is digital and I don't have to print things. So this is, this is, it's a big show. I'm doing eight pretty large prints for it. Um, and it's been exhausting. Like gallery, gallery stuff is hard. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I hope it's worth it. I hope that, uh, I hope that everyone will enjoy it and then I can show up more places and, you know, get it, get it out there in the world. That's that's great. And, and congratulations, actually. That's Thank uh, you. Order. Yeah. Welcome. So that's the, this is the, the portion where we move into the rapid fire. And uh, uh -huh. remember, remember what I said before we got started, like uh, what time around what time we'd be done. <laughs> And I'm on point. <laughs> I love being on point. You got five minutes. <laughs> so, so um, if you will, uh, rapid fire. Wait, is wait, is it going to work? I got four questions for you. Um, 
and uh, brevity is key. That's pretty much it. Um, okay. What was your first camera? Mm, Canon AE-1 film camera. It was my dad's, and he gave it to me for my photo class. Nice. What was the last book you read? Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm horrible at reading. I've read portions of a lot of different books lately, but never finished them. Uh, I was reading Art and Fear. Um, uh, some H.P. Lovecraft, you know, because there's small, short articles. Yeah. Not the whole book, though, but uh, yeah. No, it, it, we're we're just asking if you're reading, and and, and you mm -hmm. know me as, as a trying. person. No, I, I me as a person who is very much visual focused of like, man, I'm watching this. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me to read. I usually go into um, I do audiobooks. I, I I just do that. So right now I'm kind of mm -hmm. consuming, if you will, that Rick Rubin book on like creativity, and really it's kind of giving me some sense and some direction of maybe where I fit sort of this in this creative world because. I don't know. So yeah, yeah, but that's that's what I've really been on. I was trying to read some some art theory for my last class and and you think or like photo theory specifically and you think that'd be simple and you know, I'd have a handle on it, but after reading like trying to read portions of like three different books, I feel like I know less about the, you know, what photography is now than I did before. Harry. Uh two more. Um <laughs> What is your favorite? And I'm going to because you're a movie person, I'm not going to do that to you. What is your favorite genre of movie? I can tell you my favorite movie. Uh, oh. It would be it'd be Beetlejuice. Hands down, my favorite movie. Uh, I just love I've always loved it. I love uh, animation and, um, you know, just the, the weird the weirdness of it. I think it's just a perfect perfect movie you're gonna make me rewatch beetlejuice now yeah, yeah. So thanks <laughs> thanks thanks for giving me movie homework now but but mostly like drama um i watch a lot of horror i like i definitely prefer uh fantasy worlds to to real ones I watch a lot of horror as well. I am definitely during the weekends. I am in Shutter all the time, oh, nice. getting it, <laughs> just getting it, and uh, mostly the cheesy '80s ones. It's like, yo, what mm -hmm. is this again? It's like, look, I am going to watch all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and me and me and my partner, we have this thing where we're watching, especially like really bad movies. I don't know if you're a, a soccer person or what have you, but you know, they, they, so in soccer, they have like stoppage time. Like this is the actual game. This is how much we have from like pauses or whatever. We do that with the movie. So as we're watching, it's like, hold up. This is really stupid. Freeze it right there. And we're <laughs> critiquing the movie because we're definitely letterboxed out. And we'll watch like a two hour movie and it's like four hours later we finished it because we kept pausing it to make fun of certain things in it that are stupid so yeah that's great i've like, never done that like you know pause it as i was going but that that's a good idea that's great it's definitely helping this movie review podcast that i do and i was doing an episode with a photographer friend that i have isaiah winters and and we were talking about like uh, the movie the fly from 1986 and mm -hmm. i was like yeah i got a question for you bro because i know you saw it i was like is that Seth Brundle's penis in the cabinet? He's like, it is. He's like, I froze it right there for that purpose. So it's working, you know? <laughs> so there you go. Horror movies, all of it works. It just works. Um, this is the last one, and this is kind of a movie question as well. Um, so if your life was a movie, who would be the director? What would the genre be? Uh, what would the title be? Oh, gosh. Technically, I cheated. That's three of them, but it's three rapid fire questions in one. But all I can think of is Tim Burton right now because <laughs> we're talking about Beetlejuice. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with that. You know, Wednesday's popular right now. <laughs> People like that. <laughs> um, what would the title be? Or you don't have to necessarily say the title because that's that's, that's pretty oh. much a challenge. Yeah. But yeah. what, would the, what would the genre be? Because you said Tim Burton, so I kind of it's is it gonna be like kind of Beetlejuice? Is it gonna be something more uh Sweeney Toddish, I guess? Sweeney, Sweeney Todd. I'm thinking more maybe, you know, definitely probably horror for sure. Um maybe like kind of a Suspiria feel, you Ooh. know, just like I you know, just thinking of the I'm thinking of like the lighting and, and Suspiria, and it's you know, it's pretty 
you know, it's pretty wacky out there and it doesn't make any sense. You know, there's no reason that there's, you know, blues and reds are there, but it doesn't need to make sense. You know? So, so you're going to have people posing in, in shoots and then their limbs just start snapping. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> okay. I hear you. Okay. I, I've watched both of them. So shout out to you. Uh huh. So that thank you for, for indulging me that that is it's always fun I, I, you know i love a fellow horror fan so shout out to you um yeah. and so i want to thank you for coming on to the podcast and spending some time with me and um i want to invite and encourage you to tell the listeners where they can check you out your work social media website the floor is yours um you can check out my work at um it's my full name lauren castellana.com uh, you can look at some of my work on Instagram. Um, what is my Instagram handle? It would be Lauren underscore Castellana. If I have a show or had any work in a gallery at the point in time, come come look at it. You know, try to talk to me. I can I can um, do like a personal or like one on one gallery walkthrough too if you're interested. Um, yeah, I I want to talk about art so. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, I'll do my wrap up here. Um, so for Lauren Castellano, I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, photography, photographic identities in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for them. Mm-hmm.